Hello, it's me again. I'm um, doing this video from my bed. The travelling that I did, I've been home now for two weeks. The travelling has left me <laughs> exhausted. Honestly, I always have a few days where I need to rest and recuperate, but this last trip to Georgia and Amenia, oh dear me, it's really taken it out of me. But this, the, this video is about travelling around in Georgia and Armenia, what that is like for a disabled person. I'm hoping that other people that are researching going to Georgia and Armenia will find this video and get some advice because I did not see one disabled person when I was away. Um, I was away for like two and a half weeks. Turkey was way different from um, Georgia and Armenia. Turkey was actually really fine to disabled people, but Georgia and Armenia was very, very different. So I thought I would just preface the footage that I've got coming on later by doing this video here. I'm also going to put some photographs up. I've made some notes so I don't forget everything. Um, so, yeah, Georgia and Armenia. Some some people look at it as Eastern Europe. Some of the people look at it as the Middle East. I kind of see it more as the Middle East, really, because it's kind of Turkey, Azerbaijan, Iran, all that area. Um, researched for, for a year. Knew that it would be difficult and it and it certainly was difficult um would love to go back god willing would absolutely love to go back and i would say if you're disabled and if you're thick-skinned go for it if you have issues with just feeling really like what's the word like you feel ashamed you feel embarrassed you feel like you can't cope with it don't go because the attitude from many towards me as a disabled person was really horrifying to be quite frank with you um there were so many times now i've got to make this clear i'm not saying every single person was like this i'm not saying that at all but honestly I got really filthy looks from people who were disgusted with me to see me out on a mobility scooter, a disabled person out in the community. Why would a disabled person be out? You could see it on their face. I actually had people getting really angry with me, trying to get me out of the way. Um, and even though I didn't understand the language, I knew full well what they were saying. And uh, because of their attitude from their eyes, from their just, it was, hot, it was awful. People on the bus, <laughs> the bus driver. So that's the other thing I wanted to talk about. So in Georgia, there were three main forms, no, four main forms of transport. The trains, the um, marshrutas, and then the big green buses and taxis. And... We learned very quickly that you could go on a green bus because the big green bus always had a ramp. So that worked really well because we always try to travel. I always try to travel local transport as much as I can. You get a better feel for the people and a better feel for the country. So we discovered that within a couple of days of being in Georgia. And definitely there were some people on the bus which were really kind and friendly. But there were those who were just absolutely horrified to see a disabled person wanting to get on their bus with my scooter. The bus drivers, oh my goodness, they were so mean. <laughs> Some of them were so mean. They just were so frustrated with me and disgusted with me that I should be putting them out by making them get off the bus, get the ramp down, get me on the bus. They were not happy at all. So... Yeah, it was really hard. And I think if I was a disabled person that had issues with low self-esteem, um, shame, embarrassment, rejection, I think I, I it would have really broken my heart. I, I really think so. But I just tried to laugh it off. And I just tried to act friendly as well. 
Yes, but so I would really say if you are disabled and you're thick skinned and you can handle that, go for it. Because one of the ways that you you'll change a culture and the way people see you is if they see disability more and more in the community, then that's going to be a positive thing. Um, but I didn't see anybody. And there was certainly one area, the wine region in Georgia, where um, they were a lot more warmer in that community. So that makes me wonder if, because it was the wine region, if they'd had more disabled people in that community visiting. They were definitely warmer more friendly uh i had so many people wanting to like show their friends look at this machine look at this you could just guess what they're saying come and look at this come and look at this and they were absolutely amazed it was like they had never ever seen a mobility scooter in their lives so they were just amazed with that that was quite fun and then there were some that in their broken english were asking me where i got it from and how much it cost and I was really happy to share all that sort of stuff for them. I kind of think that, goodness, if I had the time and the money, selling, starting up a mobility scooter company in Tbilisi would be in a win-win situation, but that's not going to happen. Um, but, yeah, Tbilisi, Georgia, and then Yerevan, Armenia, for disability was very, very hard. I'm going to put some photographs up on how I do travel around so definitely in Tbilisi in the city there are the green buses there are ramps for you which is really easy the other buses are no good um the, the buses were really cheap I'll put the prices up on the screen later but literally every bus journey you take is one gel which works out about 33p ish so that worked really well. We did that loads, actually, just going on the local green bus. One gel. Um, when we were travelling further afield, when we were going out to the mountains and things, we hired a car. And my mobility scooter was, you can just completely dismantle it, put it back together again when you get out of the car. So that works really well. You actually do that on the train as well, which you probably saw if you've seen the overnight train to Yerevan um pavements are a nightmare so i i learned a long time ago when i was in cairo there's just no point going on a pavement i just have to brave it on the roads because you you get on a pavement and you have this long stretch of road where you can just well not road you can stretch you know go for quite a long way in the pavement and you get to the end and then there's this massive drop down and there's no drop curve anywhere so then you have to go all the way back you end up wasting time and, and battery, battery juice as well. So I just gave up a long time ago just trying to stay on pavements. And I remember at the beginning of our holiday, Tim and Sue were like freaking a bit. Like, what the heck are you doing on the road? Look at the crazy cars. And they are crazy drivers, I have to say. But it just, in the long run, you, you just have to do it really. Because trying to find drop curbs where there isn't really any drop curbs, is really difficult. And um, I wanna, I'm want i going to put some footage up, only a tiny bit of footage, but the very first day we were in Tbilisi and I said to Sue and Tim, we're going to do a video about the nightmare of what happened when we first got to Tbilisi. But um, when we first got to Tbilisi, I said to them, look, I've loaded up the, the map of where our hotel is. You go up with the suitcases, I'll go up on the scooter. I love doing that anyway, whizzing around was on the road everything was fine then i started on the road up the hill to the main part of the modern part of the tbilisi and then i realized i was coming onto this massive dual carriageway with three lanes on either side and it was it was eight o'clock in the morning by this time and it was rush hour and there were just it was mental and I was thinking, actually, this is getting worse and worse and worse. And and as I was going up this hill, from the side of this kind of cliff edge was this waterfall spraying me. So I was like, I can't see a darn thing. It was really bad. And then I thought, I thought, do you know what? I mean, I can handle Cairo and I do handle Cairo. But in Cairo, you're dealing with donkeys and horses and garages and mopeds with families of six on them. But I knew this was 
going to get really dangerous and that I was at high risk of having an accident. So I was trying to wave down the cars. They didn't give a monkeys because, you know, I'm just a disabled person on a mobility scooter. They didn't care. And then about five police cars came past, blues and twos. They just kept going past me. So I was so frustrated. I get so annoyed. And then eventually, because I was trying to stop the traffic, but they would not let me cross to a safer part. I couldn't turn around. Nobody was just trying to help me at all. So I was getting more and more wound up, actually. And then eventually a police car came, started shouting at me in Georgian. I could tell what they were saying. Why the heck aren't you over there on the pavement? So I was kind of shouting back, saying, excuse me, mate, but your stupid pavements I haven't got any drop curbs. Anyway, what they did was they stopped the whole dual carriageway, three lots of cars on each side. And then I thought, right, I'm going to get you lot back. So I went as slowly as I could across the road. I did this in Morocco once with with um, Aiden once. Went so slowly just to annoy the drivers because they're so mental crazy. But I'll I'll put on a little bit of that footage later because that was a, a bit of a hair-raising experience and I actually thought I might have had an accident that day. So, yeah, I for, as a disabled person, I, go on, I tend to go on the road and not really on the pavements. The drivers are crazy. If I was a first-time driver in a foreign country, I think I would have freaked myself. Thankfully, I'm kind of used to Israel, Jordan and Egypt, so driving around there. Well, not in Egypt. I wouldn't drive in Egypt because they're nutters. But Israel and Jordan, so kind of holds you in good state when you're on the uh, Georgian military highway, Russian highway. So um, there were cliff edges. There were literally roads where the whole side of the road had come away and it would just be this massive drop of hundreds and hundreds of feet pretty pretty crazy roads the drive the, the over there um another thing I, i'll put a picture up and maybe a bit of footage of is um how did we travel when it was all of us together so we had the three suitcases then we had three rucksacks and then maybe bags of groceries or something like that and then if we were traveling from one hotel to the train station, or the train station to the bus station to another hotel. It was quite a mission, really. It was quite exhausting. So we ended up, um, me sitting on Tim's barrel bag, it was like a sports bag, sitting on that, Tim carrying my suitcase on wheels, and then Sue taking hers. That was quite a mission, though. And then if you're trying to carry all of that stuff and people hate you because you're disabled, don't want to help you, then that's quite difficult. Um, I'll put a picture up of that though. Also as a disabled person, obviously they don't really have disabled toilets around. And like literally before COVID, like even three years ago, I would not have been able to do this. But I was able to walk just a few steps into a toilet. So say for example, I was out and about and I was busting. Uh, if I would try to find the most modern looking building that I could go to, so I'd, if I was in the city, for example, I would look for a, a modern hotel, a purpose-built hotel, and then you'd kind of have a bit more of a chance of finding a toilet that you can access, even if it's not a disabled toilet. That worked. Um, but for the most part, 99%, it, it was like hitting the jackpot. If you, if you did find a shop or a hotel or a building that did have ramps and was accessible, Otherwise, it was just no accessibility at all for disabled. So, when I remember when I booked the flat in uh, Yerevan, we booked a lovely big two-bedroomed flat in Yerevan. And I remember messaging the lady, is it definitely ground floor? Oh, yes, yes, it's ground floor. Yeah, right, it was up five lots of steps. So, it was really hard trying to... You have to get all the scooter out of the car. Then you put it all back together again to try and get in as close to the steps as possible. And then you have to take it apart, go up the steps, put it together again to put it on charge in the flat. That was quite exhausting because five flats, flights of steps, and not five flights, five steps to get to the ground floor flat. So, um, God willing, if I do get back to Yerevan, I think I'll have to stay in a, like a super duper modern hotel in order to not have that issue really um taxi drivers 
so many times I ordered a taxi because we downloaded an app. There's two apps which are really good for um, Georgia and for Armenia. Really good apps, I have to say. I can't remember what they're called, the ones that you would know about here in England. But um, so many times we ordered a taxi and as soon as the taxi driver saw me, he said, no, 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 you're not coming in mine. He just would go past. Even before I'd have time to explain that we can take the scooter apart and put it in the back, he would just drive off. Absolutely like, no way am I going to take you in the back of my car. So then what we started doing was when we were on Wi-Fi, I took a picture of my scooter together and apart in different pieces. And then I would send that on the app to the taxi driver so they could actually then see it oh, she has this machine. I will go to her, even though she has this machine. But for, for the most part, yeah, taxi drivers were not helpful at all and didn't want to know. They really didn't want to know. Um, back to the travelling around on local transport. I just wanted to say, and you'll see a bit of footage of this as well, the buses work really well. So say if I said I wanted to go to the train station the main central train station from my hotel it would tell me exactly what bus I needed to catch what colour it was what number it was exactly where I needed to stand and how many minutes it was then when we got on the bus the bus would have a map and a screen on the inside the bus and it would show you exactly where you are and where you needed to get off as well that I thought worked really really well that was actually better than UK buses I think because we don't have, not that I'm aware of, in, we don't have it down in Barnstable, in, in Devon. Um, big screens showing where you are and where you need to stop, you know. So that worked really well. Really enjoyed doing that. That certainly saved a lot of money and time and hassle. The only thing is that you need to be on Wi-Fi to get the, get the map loaded up so that you could plan your journey. There were quite a few times when um, what we would do is we'd just go to a cafe, have a coffee, get free Wi-Fi, load up what we needed to do for the next part of our journey. That We did that quite a lot, but I mean, it was all right to have a coffee break anyway because we were pretty non-stop a lot of the time. So, yeah, I'll just come back to this. This is all about travel as a disabled person. So... If you are disabled and you love exploring new places and you love the challenge, you don't have like rejection issues and stuff, please come. Come over to these countries and show them that just because you're disabled, you're not going to be at home hiding away. That we still want to live our lives as best as we can to the best of our abilities. So please come over. Uh, they need to see more of us out there. Um yeah and for on that note i just want to say that actually britain there are some really beautiful things about british culture because actually i would say 99 percent of people are really kind and helpful in this country when they see you might be struggling they automatically offer to help um which is really lovely in our of our country on that issue all right now i'm going to go now because i've been speaking for way too long and then you can see some of the footage i've got up gonna put up now bye i think we can safely say i'm glad i'm doing this on my own but even for me this is a little bit daunting it's just ridiculous yeah tell me about it mate but i can't get on the flipping curb it's ridiculous in the morning and I can't get on the flipping pavement <laughs> I know tell me about it right Tim do you have anything to say about the first part of our journey yes, it's fabulous, yes. 
We've actually decided, well I've decided that I don't really like it up around Stansted. I want to go back to Barnstable. Yeah. yeah. Turn around, turn around. Yeah. Yeah, well have you got anything to say, Sue? Um, Do you like the hotel? Well I've not I don't know because I'm going to Iraq, Iran and the Yemen on my own next year. Oh are you? Very good, Sue. So this will just be a run up to it. <laughs> Actually, we're going to be quite close to the Iran border. Right, so, for me, we made a rather big error. Actually, it wasn't our fault. We were advised to go completely the wrong bus, so we still haven't arrived at our hotel. We're quite longing to get into our room and have a lovely cup of tea and watch EastEnders. Oh. Lots. <laughs> OK, I'm just doing a little bit of footage. Tim? Oh. Just okay. a little bit of footage. Seriously? Just yeah. to say we're on the bus going back down to the centre. And um, don't complain, Tim. This is going on the YouTube oh, channel. Really? You're going to be so hey, famous. You know You're going to so, be on the I'm FBI just, wanted site. You know me, I'm all sunshine and smiles, though. So, anyway, we're on this bus and we've been on a lot of these buses now. And honestly, sometimes people are really lovely, and other times people are really not very friendly at all and quite hostile. But today we've had about three people that actually smile on us on one bus, haven't we? <laughs> it's quite nice. But we haven't had one bus driver yet that smiled at us. Well, that's not true, because the one, the one that we did, not this one, the one before, was smiling at us. Was he? He just quite kept up, yeah. Well, I don't remember yeah. him. I do yeah, not remember him. He was really smiling at us, yeah. It's funny if he did. Yeah. So basically what I'm doing is I've been singing some old classics, you know, like... Um, Tears on my pillow or Daisy Daisy or whatever to try and raise the atmosphere on these buses and to try and get people smiling but honestly some of them are really hostile but others are really lovely. I'm just filming this bit because I've just seen on the screen it's showing exactly on the map where we're going. We've logged into free wi-fi as well so we can check out the map on our phone but there's also the map on the screen so and also at the bus stops they've got the big screen saying what bus you need to go on in english and in georgian so actually it's not too hard if you can if you're even, you know speaking english you can see what, what bus number you need to get onto what region what area and each bus ride is one gel so you put your credit card in or your you know your visa card every journey is one gel which is the equivalent of 30p so this journey should be, take us right the way back down to the, the centre again, next to the main bridge that we're going to. I'm filming this bit again because we do not have this on UK buses. So I had a little notification on my phone, just say three more stops. And then on this screen, it's going to tell us exactly where each stop is to get to the central train station. So really good actually. Much better system than ours. museum 
of ethnicity, ethnicity, and um, this would be fun. I've done a place like this in Romania. That was just well, we were there for hours because it was just so interesting. Oh, probably they're probably way behind me now, aren't they? So, yeah, looking forward. Well, I hope I don't have to go up there. That'd be horrific. I hope that's the way. Is that the way to Ethnocity? Hope so. Hope so. I feel like we're going into the woods now though. I really hope this is the right way. Right, I better come off just so I need to check the map.